Had a piece of pie, had a piece of pudding. Well, I give it all away to a hugs. Howdy, good one. Down south, language is a colorful blend of vibrant parlance. Well, just on the end of the corn, I say, Lord. And down home humor. Which you did you? Hey, you didn't bring your truck with you, did you? In this part of our journey, you'll hear flamboyant and distinctive dialects from Appalachia. Hey, boy, put that car in the grudge. Down to the Tex-Mex border, where we'll see if English itself is endangered. They got calls, threats. What are you doing speaking Spanish as an official language in America? It's a sizzling combo of rich cultures and traditions. We like our food spicy, and we like our language spicy. This time on Do You Speak American? Do you speak American? Do you like speak American? Do you speak American? Do you speak American, dog? Do you speak American? Si parlo americano. Do You Speak American has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, promoting excellence in the humanities. Additional funding is provided by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. We're on a journey that takes us across the USA and through the American language. Now we're going to find out how today's Southerners answer the question, do you speak American? The greatest division America ever experienced was between North and South, and that is still reflected in our language. Now we're running along the beautiful Ohio River to Louisville, Kentucky. The Ohio River, the traditional northern boundary of the southern accent. So is it true that the um, Ohio River... Walt Wolfram, a linguist from North Carolina, is on board for this part of the trip. The first group to settle an area seems to have a lasting effect on the dialect area. And even though we've had all these changes over a couple hundred years, yeah. the original dialect boundaries seem to be fairly intact still. The first English speakers to settle around here were frontier fighters like Daniel Boone and later Davy Crockett, who pushed through the Cumberland Gap and down the Ohio and Tennessee rivers. Mostly Scots-Irish, they spread their way of speech from Pennsylvania to West Virginia and down the Appalachian Trail into Kentucky and Tennessee. That speech lives on in the hills of Appalachia, but it too is disappearing. Um, this was uh, shot in the series of Story of English, you know. Sure, and sure, was, I know I use it, it all the time. You use this? Oh, oh well, yeah. you know this then. Yeah, I know uh, well. Yeah, this is uh, Mrs. Hicks and Ray Hicks telling us how you get to their house. You fly in an airplane as far as you can come. Then you get in a car or truck and ride as far as you can go and hit. Then you get down and run as far as you can. Then you crawl on your hands and knees as far as you can come. Go that away. Then you straighten up and then you find a house. It's an old timey one. It looks haunted, but it's really not. Ray Hicks used to be famous around here. People would come from miles around to hear him tell folk tales in one of the last surviving examples of true Appalachian dialect. Now, howdy. Really that sounds more like Texas to me, but that's... that's... Well, they do use some of that in yeah. Appalachia. Howdy, Ray. Howdy. How are you today? Just to make it. How are you? Just come on in. Howdy, Ray. Just come on in. Tell us a ghost story, Ray. Tell us a ghost story. Okay. 
Ray Hicks loved to tell Jack tales. The most famous is Jack and the Beanstalk. In this story, Jack meets a beggar who gives him a magic sack. He says, I'm going to give you something. He said, here's a, a sack that if anything gets to bothering you, just say wickety-whack into this sack. Wickety-whack into the sack? Yeah, yeah, well, he's got so many of the traditional features of Appalachian dialect, the uh and a hunting and a fishing, and the use of the tar tar and the H before the it and so forth. And, and it's really neat that you preserve this because... Ray recently passed away. Today, fewer and fewer people speak like the late Ray Hicks and his wife, Rosa. The old mountain dialect may be vanishing, but when we went ashore at a little place called Rabbit Hash, Kentucky, it seemed to me the local talk was still distinctive and vigorous. How are you? Doing? Yeah. Hi there, boy, Doyle. Hi, Dwayne. Nice to meet you. Robin McNeil? Yeah. Walt Wolfram, place to meet you. Went down the road, road got muddy, stomp my toes, couldn't stand steady. Upon the hill, started seeing Sally coming, well, I thought he was old, killed my several hundred. Had a piece of pie, had a piece of pudding, well, he gave it all away to hug Sally Gooden. Do you think the language is changing much? Well, <laughs> it is. You know, now down home where I'm from, down in, you know, I'm from close to Tennessee line. I said Tennessee and Kentucky both, they claim me. Uh -huh. Tennessee claims I'm from Kentucky. Kentucky claims I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and now down there, they call a sheep, a female sheep, a ewe. Uh -huh. I mean, a yo. Up here, they, you know, they, they, call it a, <laughs> they call it a ewe. Down there, they call it a yo. Right. And then they'd say, hey, boy, put that car in the grudge. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I said, the yeah. grudge is somebody, what you have against somebody. The guy said, no. I said, Dad, tell me, put the car in the grudge every day. See, we talk like that, and y'all. Yeah. Is that one of the things you grew up oh, saying? Oh, yeah, I said, yeah. And, and over yonder. And all over that, yonder, you know, right. And, and it's a fur piece. And a fur piece. And yeah. I'll tell them that it's, it's not, well, I, when I go over to Ohio, I said, it's not a fur piece to rabbit hash. It's just three yeah. hops and jump in the Ohio River and two or three swamps, and there you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, j you know, just like you say, you know, we'd say you all, and up here they'd say yous all. Uh -huh. And, you know, yous and yos and you all and yo all. You ever hear yins? Oh, oh yuins. Oh, yeah, sir. That, that's, uh, my father was from North Carolina. It was yuins. Yeah, that's and right. They'd say, the mountains like, of North Carolina. And yuns. then when they would treat a person, a, you, know, you know, do a bad turn for it, instead of saying, I wouldn't serve a dog like that, they'd say, I wouldn't serve a dog like that. Serve a dog. <laughs> I wouldn't serve a dog like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And fetch, you know. Yeah, go fetch it. And they get me a poke to put something in. They don't call it a bag. A bag, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I know all, all that stuff, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I was playing up here one night in the, mm -hmm. in, in, in a place where they dance, mm -hmm. and some lady fell out on the floor, and I said, Hey, come here, and I'll pick you up. <laughs> I told her, I said, yeah. <laughs> You've studied so many different aspects of American speech. What would you say is the most important trend in our language now? I think that one of the most important trends is the fact that we're coming to celebrate and recognize some of the dialect differences as a part of our natural cultural heritage, uh, rather than simply try to stamp them out, to eradicate them. Speaking is part of culture. It's part of simply defining themselves. I think a sort of growing celebration of dialect differences is one of the most encouraging signs that I've seen. Today, the country speech of Appalachia has absorbed other southern dialects and traveled throughout the Sun Belt. You can hear this influence all over the USA in the lingo of truckers like David Swain with their CB radios. David's handle is spanky. Northbound. It looked good up there to Franklin, up there at 65 is where I started, okay? Everybody sounds real country when they're talking on the CB. They do, and I, I couldn't tell you why. I mean, I don't even know if I do. I, you I do? do if I, yeah, I thought you did when you were talking. It's I a, don't know. It's a CB slang, I guess. I don't know what it is. Uh-huh. Is that the same all over the country? Uh, 
Yeah, pretty much. Everybody pretty much says sounds the same way, and I don't know why. Spanky, you say you play music on the road. What's your favorite kind of music? Uh, my favorite is country music. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, I've got a, a nephew that's in the country music business, uh, Cody, and uh, he lives in Nashville. And his, his, to be honest with you, his, his CD has taken me many miles. Well, some things make me fight, man, while I'm motoring along. I like to watch a brand new backhoe tear down a hundred year old barn. Well, it makes me wish that I was rich, cause I'd buy up that farmland. Find the folks who were forced to sell and hand it back to them. Now I'm inspired. You better believe. Spanky's nephew is the country singer Cody James. Cody looks, sounds, and sings pure country. But he and Kenny Hayes, his co songwriter, aren't even from this part of the country. Neither of you is from the real South. You're originally from Oregon, you're from Maryland which is near the South, but not in. When you do this kind of music, do you have to sound country and Southern? I don't think that you necessarily have to, but it's real comfortable. And when you start doing it, like doing it, right there as an example, yeah. it's easier to talk that way than it is it to is. when you start doing it yeah. and enunciating everything perfectly. Or well, when you right. start saying doing it, it, yeah, doing it sounds it. funny coming out of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Sure it does. It's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. And it has character. It's, and it's friendly. It, yep. and very it, much so. What do you mean it has character? It has character. Uh, I don't know. The country's just, yeah. it's fun to hear. Blue eyes just gleaming, the sweetest thing I've ever seen. Music like Cody's is part of the popular culture that is making talking country the informal way to speak American. You can hear it almost anywhere, turning its Appalachian origins into a national trend. John fought has studied the New South phenomenon, that vogue for Southern ways and country talk that now seems to reach farther and farther. For a long time, uh, the most rapid population growth percentages in the U.S. have been in the inland southern area, the Sun Belt. This dialect is a very large dialect, and it's perfectly to be expected that we would see a lot of it. It has probably the largest body of speakers of any of the American dialects now. And this will only grow with time. So, Southern, Inland Southern, is now the largest dialect in America and growing? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems confirmed by the 2000 census. By contrast, the other strand of Southern speech, the dialect of the coastal or plantation South, is losing influence. It's being swept away by time and civil rights and the migration of Northerners. City dwellers in the Deep South are even pronouncing their R's. But here in Oxford, Mississippi, what's celebrated today is language that endures. Among the cultural treasures of the South is its literary tradition, and Mississippi can boast two of America's greatest writers, William Faulkner and Judora Welty. In their recorded voices, you can hear the cultivated speech of Mississippi of two generations ago. For instance, this is Judora Welty reading from her story, The Optimist's Daughter. So I was forced to the conclusion I started seeing behind me. Faye laughed, a single high note as derisive as a jay's. Yes, that's disturbing. Dr. Cortland rolled forward on his stool. Let's just have a good look. Eudora Welty told me a story about her accent. In the late 30s, she attended Columbia University in New York and lived in the women's residence. The woman who ran the residence would give free theater and concert tickets to the students. After a couple of months, Eudora went to her and said, 
Why did I never get any? And the woman said, with your accent, we didn't think you'd be interested in cultural activities. That kind of prejudice is still alive today, if more good-humored. The stand-up comedian Jeff Foxworthy bases a large part of his act around it. He must be on to something, because wherever he plays, he fills the house. Speaking of words, uh, got a few more southern words for you. Uh, first one, mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is a lot of people here tonight. It's kind of a gift. They come to me in my sleeve. I write them down. That... <laughs> Innuendo. Hey, dude, I saw a bird fly in your window. Do you think northern people think southerners are stupid because of the way they talk? Yes, I think so. And I think southerners really don't care that northern people think that. Uh, you know, I mean, some of the, the most intelligent people I've ever known talk like I do. In fact, I used to do a joke about that, about, you know, the southern accent. I said, nobody wants to hear their brain surgeon say, all right, now what we're going to do is saw the top of your head off, root around in there with a stick and see if we can't find that dad burn clot. <laughs> Urinal. I told my brother, you're in a lot of trouble when daddy gets home. <laughs> and last but not least, which you did you? Which you did you? Oh, you didn't bring your truck with you, did you? Down the great Mississippi River now, we're leaving the South. Ahead are the states where English rubs up against many languages, and speaking American takes on a whole new character. We're 10 miles up State Route 13 from Eunice, Louisiana driving past flooded rice paddies. We're going to sample some Cajun. Cajun is a dialect that has only emerged in recent generations, but has become a source of fierce local pride. Crawfish Plus. To hear the sound of authentic Cajun, turn off the road at a big water tower that says Mamou. Today, Cajun is as much tourist bait as crawfish pie or boudin sausage. Here in Carl's Restaurant, which describes itself as the most famous restaurant in Mamou, you can hear English and French and Cajun, which is kind of a mixture of the two with other influences. <laughs> While I was hanging out in Carl's, there was a steady stream of people arriving at Fred's Lounge across the street. Fred's motto is, Laissez les bons temps rouler, let the good times roll. The lounge has become an institution, as has its owner, Aunt or Tante Sue. Tante Sue, would you describe what happens here on a Saturday morning? The only description I have about Fred's Lounge is we have a wonderful time. And I think this, this is one of the places that you have the most true feeling of Cajun culture there is. People coming in at eight o'clock. Uh, we promote to offer them Bloody Mary because it's a mild drink and it's very good. Once that band starts playing, they do start drinking. Every Saturday, it's not just drink that's being mixed, but language too. 
as the local radio station broadcasts live from Fred's. Jack Miller's barbecue sauce, le vrai goût de kajan dans chaque bouteille. Jack Miller's barbecue sauce emmène le meilleur flavor. Mm, mm, C'est bon. Oh, la ah, sauce ah, à Jack Miller's. Jack Miller's barbecue sauce. All right. Special request, la chanson de Mardi American English smothered in Cajun is what you hear in Tant Sue's speech. We have Fred's Lounge t-shirt with the accordion on the front, which is our regular logo. And when the accordion starts playing in the band, I play my accordion on my t-shirt. And I have a great time, and I don't miss a note. I don't know how to play the accordion, but I don't miss a note on my t-shirt. Perhaps it's best to leave before Tant Sue gets too carried away with her accordion play. I'm heading out of Mamou to the west. I'm on my way to the Texas border and the next leg of my journey through American English. We've just been listening to French here in Louisiana. In fact, this whole area could still be speaking French if Thomas Jefferson hadn't bought almost everything west of here in the Louisiana Purchase. Or, by another turn of history, it could be speaking Spanish, as some Americans still fear it might. But Spanish is only one of the language influences we're going to be looking into as we move across the state of Texas and down to the Mexican border. The Texas accent has its roots home on the range. You can hear it on the Bar J Ranch near Beeville, when the young cowhands, slow talking and laconic, tell how to round up cattle. You just gotta go out and kind of slow and talk to them, and you can't rush them because they'll go to tearing down fences and all that. But like the cattle we worked earlier this morning, we went out there nice and slow, and they went straight for the brush. And we, we, they're probably still out there. Depends on how much you, you work them and stuff. Once you break one loose from the herd, she's going to be a little bit wilder, a little bit more uh, hot-headed than the other cattle because she's away from our herd. Texas speech is a combination of two southern dialects. Some of those who settled here came from the plantation areas of Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Others came down from Appalachia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. The result is a kind of Southern speech that's different from anything else. Add to that a mixture of Germans, Poles, and Czechs who immigrated directly to Texas, and you have something quite distinct. Well, you shoot. Well, you got your head gate there where you can get up there and work on the horns and tag them and all that. And uh, you can get a brand on them without them moving around and, and all that. Jake describes rides. They're not, we're not hurting the animal. We're just restraining it so we can work on it properly. You got it? Yeah, you got it. That Texas accent is so catching that outsiders who move here, like ranch owner Linda Blackburn, can't help picking up that twang. Yeah. You must really love this, do you? Oh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Being out in the open, I'm not a house person. Uh, love the horses, dogs. They're working in increment of this situation here. And, of course, the boys. Look at them. <laughs> wouldn't you like this, too? <laughs> I 
Today, only 1% of Texans ride a horse to work. The rest, as they say around here, are all hat and no cattle. Cowboy words include wrangler, maverick, rustler, and chuck wagon. When we visited her ranch, Linda organized an old-time cookout. But this is like a stew uh, in a gravy. This is all authentic the way it used to be done? Yes, sir. Uh, on the, uh, yeah. and what, what's the, name? the Wild West and Western movies have helped spread phrases like hot under the collar, and bite the dust that go with the cowboy's deadpan sense of humor. Well, the 2 a.m. call is no fun at all for a rancher who needs his rest. The heck with that thing. Just let it ring. Old Bud wouldn't leave his warm nest. But Bud, Liz cried, maybe somebody's died. Her voice, though uncertain yet warning. Well, Liz, Bud said, if somebody's dead, they'll still be dead in the morning. One major influence on Texas talk comes from Spanish, originally spoken here when Texas was part of Mexico. On the Bar J Ranch, some of the boys practicing their rodeo skills come from Spanish-speaking families that have been American for generations and for whom a ranch is a... Say in Spanish, mm -hmm. rancho. And what does it mean in Spanish? Basically, the same thing means in English. Uh -huh. It's a place where the cattle... Rodeo. Rodeo? You know, you get a wild cow, you get a, a bronchy horse, and the cowboy tries to, to see how much pride he's got to ride him or to handle him. Rodeo, bronco, stampede, corral. Like today's taco, fajita, nacho, and enchilada, it all comes from Spanish. Lasso. This is what you throw at the animal to catch it. Bronco, the young horse, it's not quite broke. Pinto, the color of a horse or a bean. Vamos, it means let's go. When you think about Texas, you think about cowboys and cattle. You don't think about cotton and slavery. But that's in the history of this dry, flat, and stiflingly hot East Central Texas. This has been cotton country ever since the time of slavery. After slavery was abolished, this land was worked by dirt-poor sharecroppers. I'm meeting two linguists at the country store in Springville, a tiny community sandwiched between two Union Pacific Railroad tracks. For more than 17 years, Guy Bailey and Patricia Sukoravila have been conducting a remarkable piece of research into the language of local African Americans. How you doing? Well, welcome to Springville. Thank you. Welcome okay. to the train. Welcome yeah. to the train, right? Yeah, all right. You have these all the time? Yeah, yeah. About all every the time. few minutes, right? For generations of sharecroppers, black and white, the country store was the center of their lives. This is where they bought provisions, stores, and tools. And this is where they borrowed money from the white store owner until they sold their cotton. The store has been owned by the same family for more than a century. In many ways, it's hardly changed at all. It's in a kind of time warp. When I first started out with this project, I went sit out at the general store inside and um, basically hang out there most of the day and uh, interact with people who came in and talk with them and not necessarily record right at first um, until I got to know people. Hey, stranger. 
The mail is still delivered at the store. There is no home delivery. People oftentimes...